Gun Violence and Poverty, an analysis of the causes and consequences of shootings and gang violence in low-income neighborhoods and youth. In the U.S. in 2020, more than 2,800 deaths in youth aged 0 to 19 were due to firearm homicide, and 13% of youth aged 14 to 17 reported having hearing gunshots or witnessing gunfire. As violence has increased dramatically in the U.S. in the past few years, discussions about shootings and gun homicides have ramped up. While some people think that gun violence is inevitable and there is not a definitive way to prevent it, many people believe that legislation should be enacted that lessens the opportunity for people to partake in gun violence. In these conversations, most people tend to focus on the legal aspects of reducing gun violence, such as improved neighborhood policing and stricter gun laws. However, they often overlook the root causes of interpersonal gun violence. Examining the underlying causes and consequences of gun violence is important to not only understand how to best create policy that reduces shootings, but also to understand why people feel the need to participate in gun violence, such as sense of belonging in their gang or support or to support their family in economic deprivation. In the U.S., gun violence is most prevalent in low-income neighborhoods in large cities. A prime example of this trend is Chicago. In Chicago, the number one cause of death for ages 15 to 34 is homicide. The neighborhoods where these homicides occur have high levels of unemployment, low median household incomes, and are usually racially segregated. Income is a significant determinant for life expectancy in Chicago. The life expectancies for men and women in high-income neighborhoods in Chicago are 75 and 81, respectively, but in low-income neighborhoods, life expectancy is 71 for men and 76 for women. The neighborhoods with the lowest life expectancy are most likely to be poor and African-American, and 70% of these communities have high levels of gun violence. Since most of the communities that have high levels of gun violence also have a high percentage of people below the poverty line, people living in these communities cannot easily move away. Therefore, they become tracked in a systemic cycle of poverty and gun violence. During the Great Migration in the early 20th century, racial segregation was employed through school segregation and redlining, creating sides in the city, which caused Black families not to be able to move out of disadvantaged neighborhoods. People were devastated and dealing with multi-generational economic deprivation, so they resorted to violence. As a result, violence in Chicago to this day remains primarily in non-white neighborhoods, and these areas experience the highest number of homicides per year, one in white neighborhoods versus up to 23 in black neighborhoods. In addition to economic deprivation, racial segregation also leaves people in a cycle where they cannot escape gun violence due to generational wealth disadvantage. Violence is majorly prevalent in marginalized disadvantaged youth, the young population most likely to be affiliated with gangs. For example, youth who are gang members are more likely to engage in criminal behaviors even if they've had no history of delinquency before, and the youth who participate are more likely to be exper experiencing poverty and have access to firearms. Therefore, young children see gun usage as a way to fit in with the group and keep the community bond that comes with participation in the group's activities. Being in the gang fulfills their sense of belonging capability, which is why they are more likely to commit gun homicides. Youth who participate in gang violence are often doing so because they are struggling financially and want a way to earn income while being recognized with dignity from their peers. Therefore, participation in gang activity is not due to the desire to commit homicides, but rather to lessen financial burden and form social networks. Research performed on inner city Boston shows that although many people view gangs as a personal choice to get involved with gun violence and criminal activity, people often enter gangs with the hope of gaining stability in their lives. During the epidemic of youth violence in Boston in the late 1990s, industry fled the city, city, leaving children to grow up in adverse economic conditions. In order to cope with broken families and economic hardship, some youth joined gangs for a sense of affiliation and security. However, being a member in the gangs came at a cost for them. In order to protect themselves when engaging in drug deals, they had to be armed with a gun. The youth were forced to participate in gun violence even if they had no history of criminal activity before and most gun deaths that occurred in gangs during this time were in poor black neighborhoods and the gangs composed about 60 percent of the homicides in the city the youth engagement in gun in gang violence in boston is an example of how economic and racial inequality exposes young children to gun violence making them more likely to engage in gun homicides even if that was not their original intention with becoming a member of the organization Although people often claim that there is no moral reason to partake in gun violence, many people who participate in gang activity view violence as morally permissible if it's performed in self-defense of a psychological or personal attack on them. 
For example, youth often feel an extreme sense of belonging in the group that if an outsider of the gang disrespected a juro or a gang member with high status, they would feel obligated to employ violence as a means of protection. In addition to self-preservation, they also feel a moral obligation to utilize violence to protect the dignity and autonomy of those in their social network. People in gangs make a tragic choice to protect either the well-being of a gang member who may provide them with economic or social opportunities or to protect a stranger. However, from a contractualist perspective, violence to people outside of the gang cannot be justified. When a person participates in gang violence, they burden the outsiders who are hurt. If they choose not to participate in gang violence, they are also burdened, but not as much as their victim. For example, violent perpetrators may not be able to meet their basic needs without the money gained from violence, but monetary gain does not compare to the loss of health or the loss of life of the victims of violence. If the gang members were going to use the money gained from the attack to purchase food, the lack of money will burden their bodily health. But if the victim of the attack gets shot and can no longer walk, not only is their bodily integrity violated from the attack itself, but their bodily health will continue to suffer throughout the rest of their life. The people participating in gang violence cannot perceive their lack of money as more of a burden to their autonomy and well-being than the people being brutally attacked or killed unless the gang members are in imminent danger. In America, many people believe that it is necessary that the federal government take steps to reduce gun homicides. Currently, all 50 states have some sort of gun laws or regulation of gun usage, but the federal government does not have the ability to change these laws. Citizens often believe that there should be stricter gun regulation because gun carrying in a community with high poverty levels leads to increased likelihood for deadly gun violence. Youth who were exposed to gun violence in their childhood are 70% more likely to carry a gun than those who were not exposed. There must be some intervention by the government that addresses the arduous cycle of interpersonal gun violence and poverty. However, people living in low-income neighborhoods often feel that they need to carry a gun to protect themselves. For example, in a longitudinal study of inner-city youth living in public housing, researchers found that gun carrying was associated with fear and loathing, where youth living in low-income neighborhoods carry a gun for fear of both their own and their families' lives. If guns are taken away from these youth, they may feel like their autonomy of self-defense has also been taken from them. They also might be scared to participate in their daily activities that fulfill their capabilities, such as working and socializing. Although many people think that the best way to lessen gun violence is through incarceration or high levels of policing, Patrick Sharkey suggests that mobilization of nonprofit organizations to communities with high levels of gun violence can be more efficient. Violent policing and incarceration are less of a reduction of violence than they are a transfer of violence, proving that the government needs to intervene in a non-aggressive way to stop the cycle of gun violence. Nonprofit intervention for reducing gun violence in poor inner city communities is an outlet that should be explored through the implementation of youth initiatives such as after school programs. Gun control can be an effective method for reducing gun deaths, especially in youth and poor communities. Research shows that the Brady Bill, which mandates background checks for gun purchasing, lowers the coefficient of gun violence from 1.347 to 0.892 for people experiencing poverty. However, education on the value of life and criminal implications of gun violence can be more beneficial to further reduce, reduce gun violence. People living in poor communities are unlikely to stop participating in gun violence just because obtaining a gun is illegal if they feel like gun violence is the only option for them to fulfill their capabilities. There is a higher correlation between poverty and firearm deaths than there is between the presence or absence of gun laws, so placing higher restrictions on purchasing guns in poor communities will not significantly reduce gun violence. The best option for lessening gun deaths in low-income neighborhoods is not making guns illegal, illegal, but rather educating youth on the consequences of gun violence and the proper storage and use of guns as a self-protection weapon. When addressing the issue of interpersonal gun violence in the United States, people often assume that placing stringent gun laws on communities will solve this systemic issue on its own. However, people will continue to resort to gun violence through illegal gun purchasing or usage if it's the only way they can obtain the resources necessary to meet their needs. The best way to lessen gun gun homicides in poor communities is with a coupling method that allows people, especially youth living in these areas, to feel secure, while also making sure that all people are protected. Children should not have to make the tragic choice of participating in gun violence in order to feed themselves or leave the house for school. There needs to be stricter laws with regards to carrying guns so communities experiencing poverty are able to alleviate the cycle of violence and poverty because growing up in poor neighborhoods already makes youth more likely to engage in violent behaviors. But these laws need to be put in place in conjunction with other need-based programs since many people in these communities are participating in gun homicides to support themselves or their families.